and it's finished. Okay, so we have 25 minutes to share some ideas. And that's an example of the first one, which is what I want <clears throat> is for you to buy into my agenda. But I'd like you to do it spontaneously. Actually, um, somebody set it up today. So, you know, you had kind of already self-regulated and, and become quite compliant. You were sitting in your chairs. You'd maybe a bit of fidgeting, switching your phone off, writing important notes. And, um, and you were kind of becoming ready. Okay? What I'm interested in is doing something that engages your attention spontaneously. What I want is I switch it on, I look at it, and I stay invested in it. I mean, I do believe, I've seen it before, but I still think it's fabulous. Okay, so I'm really, really looking at it. And when it's finished, I look up and I look at you. You've been looking at it, I've been looking at it. In that moment where we connect afterwards, we have an experience in common. And those places, those moments of connection, that is where communication, social interaction, and shared attention, that's where it flourishes naturally. At no point did somebody say, sitting, sitting, looking, listening, going through all those prompts. Actually, I just did something which I hoped you would find worth the effort of looking at and engaging with. Because if you buy in, we're in a much better place to start. Because we then have a shared experience, something in common. So even if the rest of the day doesn't match with your expectations, and I don't say anything sensible or useful, I would still have the singing operatic gorilla planted in your memory, which I might be able to use to lead your learning forward in one way or another. But shared experiences are essential, and typically developing children or socially motivated children buy in for the joy of being a part of the group. So you see children in reception classes abandoning something they're really enjoying to sit on the carpet and do something which is pretty dull for 20 minutes with a lot of waiting in it. And, and typically developing children just do it. I mean, I just look at that. I think that's a miracle. Look at that. Why would you leave the train set if you've just got it all lined up the way you want it and you've got nobody else interfering to go and sit on a carpet tile between two people you don't know to answer a question about whether you're here or not. <laughs> Sometimes when we see things from the child's point of view, we can begin to understand perhaps why the buy-in is not happening spontaneously. And perhaps the question we could ask ourselves is how could we produce something in that carpet time which was as good as a train set? which was really worth the trouble of travelling for. Then, in fact, not just the worth the trouble of travelling for, but getting there first so you get a good view. <gasps> and we're beginning to change the way we think. Um, I work mostly with children with autism, so I'm thinking a lot about how could we get those children usefully included. And I'm thinking about the common ground, it is becoming uh, very current that we think about the disability, that we focus on what the child can't do. But actually, if we want them to be included into our classrooms, we need to find the common ground as well as identifying the things we're going to have to adapt. But what we want more than anything is for the child to develop a love of learning. Because if you get that buy-in, you've equipped the child with a skill for life. And that's what I'm thinking about all the time when I'm writing programs, which is what people expect a speech therapist to do. They go, can you write a program? I go, I could. I'm just wondering where it will end up. If I write it on a piece of paper, is it going to go in the child's file without ever hitting the classroom? Would you rather that I came in and ran a session? Would you rather that I came in and looked at your, you know, took part in your literacy session and then thought a bit with you about how we could spice it up so that this one fancied to go at it as well, but that it still worked for everybody else. You know, which would you prefer? You've got this amount of my time. How would you like it used? Please choose the practical stuff because the, um, the paperwork bit is very dull. 
uh, necessary to a degree, but dull. The other thing is I like to try and keep it simple. For most of the special educational needs that are identified, there is st fairly straightforward, accessible on the internet, good practice guides. These are the things that work with this sort of child. These are the things that usually work if the child is autistic, okay? These are the things that usually work if the child's got any kind of special educational needs. You need an open mind, a welcoming attitude, and see it from the child's point of view, and that means you've got to see it through the eyes of a child whose life is being lived with a particular set of differences in their neurological setup. And it doesn't have to be an awful lot more complicated than that. But all that kind of basic information is available on the internet. You don't, you know, sometimes the reports and the files are a bit like this, and you think, where shall I start? I'm tired already. You know, Sunday evening, I fancy a glass of wine, something on the telly. And now I'm plowing through yards of people telling me roughly the same thing, whereas what I really want is when the child hits the classroom, please make sure it's structured that you work visually first, orally second, and that you give this child a clear plan of what is happening today so that his anxieties stay at a manageable level. I think that would be more useful than me listing the multiple diagnoses that have been made and all the emphasis on the differences and the idiosyncrasies and this business where people go around going, this one, he's very, very complex. And in my brain, I'm thinking, oh, my God, that sounds hard. That sounds really difficult. Very, very complex. Sounds like really hard work. And then we meet the child and we think, oh, I see. So he's on the autistic spectrum. Actually, that gives me a clue about what's likely to work. Yes, of course, he is unique. He or she is completely unique. I get that. So am I. And so are you. But if we're going to work together in a group... We need to find the common ground, take into account some of the idiosyncrasies, some of the things that will be different. But we need to stay focused on what's possible and the common ground and how we can exploit that. Because that will give us a sensible way forward. Because if we've got to have totally individualized programs for every single child, I think it becomes unmanageable very quickly. And you see teachers you know, very politely, not rolling their eyebrows, uh, rolling their eyeballs, but, but breathing deeply as they listen to you saying, this child's got to have a totally individual plan. He's going to have a one-to-one -one support. He needs this, he needs that. And I know, because I've been in that position running a class of 30, I'm thinking, what am I doing with the others? <laughs> when am I going to fit this in? How am I going to collect this data? Where's it all going? And I think our sanity is an important part of this because we really need to enjoy what we're doing if we're going to rock up and do it day after day after day. Um, so in my slightly <coughs> varied career, I have uh, been in the role of a class teacher as well as speech and language therapist. Um, I've run an early intervention centre. You know, I've had a stab at a few things, but I do know that you, somehow you have to find something that is going to get the children engaged, principally engaged, without being reliant on a one-to-one -one prompt or support. Because what we're aiming for is life with us in the community for these children with special educational needs. Not it's only possible with a bolt-on adult age 23. So we may need one-to-one -one support to begin with, but it's how is that used so that it <laughs> builds independence rather than prompt dependence? So we need to see the common ground as well as the complexities. That, I mean, that doesn't sound too difficult. I mean, for a start, they're children, aren't they? And I'm thinking, okay, so he's a small child, he's four, he's a little bit exotic, and we've got one or two things going on that aren't, you know, don't make a lot of sense to me. I'll tell you what, he I bet he likes water pouring. And if I add food colouring to that and pour it all over a shower curtain, I bet that gets in. Okay, I think it'll get the others as well. And we could measure how much we're going to put in the jug. Okay, so now we're doing maths. And we could write some words on it as we're doing it. Okay, but basically, there's going to be the water pouring that gets the kid in. So I'm going to think of as many different ways to pour water in real life, not on the whiteboard, but in real life, we're going to do a lot of water pouring. And we're going to make sure everybody's got a good view. And we're totally going to go for it. And I'm going to weave my curriculum objectives through an activity that I think will bring the kids in. Because if they buy in and develop some stamina for my agenda, I can teach them so much more. 
and if I develop a love of learning, they will then tolerate doing all sorts of things which don't, on an immediate basis, seem to be important, but connect with our end goal. But you've got to get the buy-in to begin with. And we're trying really hard to move away from the constant prompting. Because what we're seeing, particularly in the field of autism, is that children then rely on it. They haven't learned how to do it independently. So in the Attention Autism Programme, we no longer use prompts like looking, sitting, listening, gentle hands, use your words, which is an intriguing one, isn't it? Because if somebody said to me when I was in a real fuss and a bit of a lather, use your words, I'd be thinking, use yours. <laughs> because if I could think of what to say, I would have said it. Well, <laughs> what you mean is talk to me. Tell me what the matter is. You know, and that's the other thing we're looking at is let's use naturalistic language. Let's use the natural flow. That in itself can be made very simple, but it matches much better with the way we talk to people in the community. So in our work with the Attention Autism Program, we're looking at this, ba this question as a kind of a basic thing. Do you offer an irresistible invitation to learn? The last time a child that you're concerned about, that has special educational needs, did not actually do the right thing at the right time, what was it that you wanted them to do? And was it irresistible? Or was it a worksheet? Or was it threading three beads? Or was it a posting box that they've done every day since they arrived because it's in their teach station? What was it? Was it fabulous? Were you looking forward to it? Or was it something to be endured until it was completed because then you can have a shot at the iPad? When we set up the Early Intervention Centre, we asked ourselves, OK, we want to offer an irresistible invitation to learn. And we went through the entire day looking at everything that we were going to ask the children to do. And we asked ourselves, does it belong in the irresistible pile or does it belong in the compliance pile? And there are some things which necessarily you have to learn to comply with. Washing your hands after you've been to the toilet, pulling your trousers up, waiting in line for lunch, learning not to be first, those kind of things. They belong in the compliance pile. What we were really pushing ourselves to do was to make sure that none of the curriculum was in the compliance pile. We wanted the whole of the curriculum in terms of numeracy, literacy, knowledge and understanding of the world, all that stuff, social, emotional, we wanted that all in the irresistible pile because we wanted the child to buy in. And it's quite challenging because, you know, as a speech and language therapist, I have to say I have done hours of incredibly tedious therapy, action pictures, <laughs> sequencing pictures, how to make a slice of toast, you know, I've done those kind of programs. I've written them and I've handed them out. But to be honest, I haven't done one at all in the last 20 years because they're very, very dull. And they don't actually address, for or in autism, this willingness and understanding of why you would communicate, why you would share information about what the picture is telling. Okay, so we, we need to kind of rethink that. And we started to think about an irresistible invitation to learn. And that's also based on our understanding of how attention skills develop. Typically, developing children take five to six years to develop the skill of being able to do two things at once in a distracting environment. I mean, it's absolutely mesmerizing. So that's most kids get there by year one. But before that come quite a number of stages where the child is highly distractible. That is a part of typical development. So if your child has global developmental delay, it's possible the reason they're not concentrating is because they haven't developed focused and sustained attention in a distracting environment yet. You have to learn how to do it. The next stage is the child can glue their attention for periods of time to a concrete task of their own choice. Oh, that looks very like this child who's lying on the floor looking at the wheels on the train set. Fantastic attention for his own agenda fleeting for yours. <laughs> and that's because the child hasn't bought in. If you can get the child to buy in, you get good attention. But it means you've got to lower the distraction levels and you've got to make your activity highly desirable. Then a child in your group 
can manage even if their attention skills are developing in uneven ways. But how, you know, how can you do that when you've got all the rest of the group to deal with? Well, I think there are ways we can think about that in that would it do the rest of the group any harm if they also had some work that helped them focus and sustain their attention in a group for the adult-led agenda? I'm thinking it perhaps might be quite useful for all of them. And I might simplify my language in the first presentation of the activity so that it met the needs of the child with special needs. And then I would add more complex language and additional linguistic opportunities so that it added a challenge for the other children in the group. And that's this wonderful thing you people in education get taught, differentiation. We don't get taught that in speech and language therapy. We get taught about individualization, okay? So um, we need to be thinking about those kind of things. Do you offer an irresistible invitation to learn? If the answer is no, you're already on the back foot. If you have to prompt a child to join your activity, you're on the back foot because what you want is for them to buy in. And I think we could use our own involvement so when I showed you the singing operatic gorilla, I was completely and utterly absorbed in it myself. My own engagement helps you connect and make the right, uh, the, make the right response. But classrooms are often full of people multitasking, giving instructions, finding the right pace on the whiteboard, um, you know, handing out notes, guiding um, other adults in the classroom what to do. And actually, if that is what's happening... You are modeling multitasking, which to a child who's a visual learner looks very like highly distracted behavior. So if you want the child to concentrate, everybody in the group concentrates at the same time on the same thing. So the leading adult is doing what they're presenting and the supporting adults are doing it as well. They are not washing paintbrushes, writing home books, setting up the next thing. Everybody has to behave as a life coach. If the child behaved like any adult in the room, would they be doing the right thing at the right time? We have adults in our classrooms. We have additional adult support. Let's use them as models rather than constant prompts. Okay? Yes, the adult assigned to a child is there to help watch their back. Yes, and to keep them safe. But more than anything, they're there as a life coach which is do what you want the child to do. It's a highly visual teaching strategy. The other thing is we use fun and laughter. In the Attention Autism Programme, we give ourselves full license to have a really good time. And we acknowledge that laughter is a very profound um, social behaviour. Children learn to smile at about six weeks, then it's shaped up to social smiling. They smile at people. Why do they do it? Because it keeps people engaged. Okay. It's a highly, highly social piece of behavior. We have two sorts of laughter. We have the kind of <laughs> polite laughter. I want to buy in. I want to be in your group. I want you to like me. I want you to know I like you. You know, it communicates quite a lot. And then you have the complete and utter loss of self-control, belly laugh, giggles, etc. Both give your brain a little squirt of the chemicals that make you feel good. Well, let's use that as the most fantastic stress management um, strategy. And it flushes the cortisol out of your, your body so you no longer feel quite so on edge. And we remember things that we have enjoyed. Look at your friendship group. It's full of the people who find the same things funny that you do. You know, this is sensible. This is common sense. It's very cheap. It's utterly available. Hurrah! Have a good time at work. And I don't mean you've got to party from nine o'clock until three o'clock. But what I mean is enjoy it and use a very healthy license to laugh. If something goes wrong, it's not just the data is going to be screwed up. Oh, here's an opportunity. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's terrible. And you can demonstrate through your own playful response that actually the world is still turning that it's resilience that matters here. You know, you can laugh at yourself, have another go. Oh, that's a very important lesson. But we only get we, our peak performance in identifying the difference between wholehearted 
laughter because something is really funny, and polite laughter, we peak aged 30. So I've peaked and gone over the top. Some of you still haven't made it. But you've got to be in a group where people laugh a lot in order to develop that understanding. And the only problem we had with this as, a, as an approach in the early intervention center was people saying to us, I can see you're having a good time, but do you do proper therapy as well? And I'm going, hmm, that's an interesting comment, isn't it? Because what do you think proper therapy looks like? And people are often expecting something where you're sitting at a desk and you're being serious. But that's actually not what inspires children to communicate and to buy in to an activity that might be quite challenging for them to complete. So we're going to give ourselves license to laugh. And we're also going to use this thing um, that Martin Seligman writes about. It's the power of fascination and flow. If you are utterly intrigued by something, you buy in, you are completely absorbed by it. You forget the fact that you've put your uncomfortable pants on today and that you haven't had any breakfast and that somebody was annoying because you're so completely <coughs> absorbed that your processing is spot on. When was the last time the child that you're perhaps supporting or considering today bought in to the point where they were in fascination or flow? For me, it happens practically every day. I'm intrigued. I mean, there's a lady in the back who's got the most amazing nails. I'm straight over there. Look at those nails. And she, God bless her, she shows me her nails. Then there's a lady with really good shoes, kind of sparkly and pink. And I'm utterly intrigued. I find life fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And recently, um, I've been traveling up to Lincolnshire, and I'm about to, give, uh, to run some training. And um, I'm a little bit late, but I'm stuck behind a tractor in a very small lane. And the farmer appears to be shooting hay at the cows with this kind of blower. And there's hay charging out, and the, and the cows are in there like that. And I think, I've got to have a look at that. So I'm out of the car having a look, and I say to the farmer, what are you doing? And he says, I'm giving them breakfast. I say, good grief. Lunch is going to be an experience in Lincoln. <laughs> I'm completely and utterly absorbed in what follows was a conversation that distracted me completely from the fact that I was late and that I was anxious. I mean, I couldn't have got there any faster anyway. But, I mean, I've learned something about cows. I'm not sure it's going to be terribly important. But it's, it's fascinating. I find life fascinating. It's what we want for the children, isn't it? We want them to develop a love of life. Not just can they add two and two to make four, not just to complete a worksheet, but that where knowing how many cows in the field adds to the story, knowing how fast this stuff was coming out was intriguing, learning, you know, how might you control that? How might you make a machine like that to play with at home? Ooh, I mean, that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, and something I'm quite interested in devising myself. Because we want this love of learning, we can get horribly bogged down with the special need, with the bits that aren't going very well, with the things that are troubling us, that are stopping the child from scoring properly, that are perhaps are making them feel unhappy or distressed or anxious. And then that makes us anxious too, because actually we are all motivated to get these children moving in the right directions. But if we stick to good practice, remember a sense of humour, commit utterly to your material and make sure it's as good as it possibly can be. Laugh frequently. Allow yourself to be fascinated and keep these children in the world and in our schools with us, with all their quirks and their wonderful bits, so that life becomes more interesting for, for all of us. Ooh. 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 Oh. oh, wow, I know. Thing is, we don't really need magic. You and I, we, we can all do it. See the child first. Remember the world is an astonishing place. And stay open and flexible in our thinking and enjoy our jobs. Thank you very much indeed.